Understanding Survival Part 1. This is going to be a two, maybe a three-part mini-series on survival. And this topic here is going to be utterly foundational, utterly foundational to any kind of personal development work that you ever do in your life and to any kind of spiritual work that you ever do. This is the essence. This is the root of all behavior change in humans because all human behavior ultimately is rooted in survival. And by the time we're done with this mini-series, this will change how you understand your entire life and how you see the lives of everybody around you. Let me give credit here to Peter Ralston, who's been a pioneer in this domain and uh, really instrumental in helping me to understand the extent and the importance of survival in any kind of behavior change. Also, let me read a quote to you from Peter Uspensky. Now, this is a different Peter, not to be confused with Ralston. Uh, and he's got a great quote that goes right along with our theme here of survival. Peter Ruspensky says, quote, Man is a machine which reacts blindly to external forces, and, this being so, he has no will and very little control of himself, if any at all. What we have to study, therefore, is not psychology, but mechanics. End quote. I love that. And that's exactly what we're going to be discuss uh, discussing over the next two episodes is, uh, is a lot of mechanics showing you just how mechanical you are. This word mechanical is a really good word because it describes why people behave the way they behave. They behave very much like chimps or like animals or like robots. And even though I can tell you that and you can agree with me, uh, the depth of it and the extent of it has not dawned on you yet until we really go through these explorations and I'm going to give you some homework assignments that are going to help you to just start to discover just how mechanical you are in your life. And of course, mechanical is the opposite of conscious. So if all personal development and spirituality is about becoming more conscious, and it is, then your greatest enemy is mechanicalness. So what we need to do is we need to really study your own our own mechanicalness, the mechanicalness of humans. So let's uh, even take one further step backward and, and really start somewhere very fundamental, which is I want to take a look at survival as a metaphysical thing, not just as a physical activity. See, the problem is that uh, modern science does not have a good handle on survival and its importance in human affairs. Uh, you know, <laughs> as a... Uh, as, as amazing uh, as that sounds, it's true. Because th this topic, you know, modern science thinks of survival maybe in evolutionary terms as a biological process. Of course, all organisms in life needs to survive, uh, obviously. Uh, but, but there's something very, uh, very deep going on here, which is much more profound than just biological survival or, or physical existence. And this is the metaphysical level. So let's ask some metaphysical questions here, such as, what is survival? Why do survival? Why struggle at all? Why do anything at all in life? Why move at all? Why does an organism just sit still for its whole life? Why does it struggle? Why defend anything at all? Because survival, of course, involves a lot of defending of stuff. And what is being defended? Why be one way versus another way? Because that's a lot of what survival boils down to, is ways of surviving, which means you're choosing between one way versus another. Also, why seek any kind of change at all? Why manipulate anything at all? Because, of course, survival involves a lot of manipulation. And what are we manipulating towards? And perhaps most fundamentally, why even live? Why not just lay down and die? What's wrong with that? And according to whom is survival important? And who chooses what should survive and what shouldn't? 
why survive some things but not others? I'm going to be using survive in this weird uh, way as a verb sometimes. Why survive some things and not others? Which just means, why have certain things persist and not others? Is survival an, uh, a rational activity or is it irrational? And finally, is there anything which is not survival? What is the opposite of survival? So those are some interesting deep questions that I encourage you to contemplate on your own. Really think about them. And we'll be answering some of them indirectly as we're going down here and covering all the material that I want to cover. Uh, but let's, let's begin at the very beginning. I want to tell you the story of how survival came into existence. So imagine, if you will, that in the beginning, in the universe, there was absolutely nothing. Total emptiness or formlessness. Then, all of a sudden, a form appeared. The very first form. It was a thing. It was something distinct and specific. And in this case, let's just imagine, for sake of argument, that it was just a cloud of particles, like a gas cloud, out in, in the middle of nowhere, in this emptiness. So this gas cloud was like the first object, and there it was. But then, of course, you know, the environment started moving around. There were other objects in the environment. Uh, there was uh, wind and radiation and the pull of gravity and black holes, other things. And so, of, key, of course, all those are objects themselves, but we're just looking at this cloud. So this cloud, now that it's interacting with all these other objects, you see they pull and tug and, and warp and morph this, this form, which is the cloud, until it becomes something totally different than it originally was. Like, let's say the cloud had a certain shape, like it was a circular shape, perfect sphere. And then, you know, by, by getting pulled by gravity and wind and stuff, it just, after a certain point, it completely dissipated and you could no longer tell that it was a cloud anymore. And so in a certain sense, we could say the cloud died. Now, of course, the cloud wasn't really alive. It was just a shape, just a form. And it didn't really care about whether it was alive or dead. And in fact, so this cloud, you know, see, it didn't have a sense of self. And it didn't have any desire to survive because it literally didn't care what happened to it. More than that, it didn't even know that it was a cloud. See, we as humans, we look at it and we project onto it that, oh, it's a cloud, it's a, it's a form. But you have to think more fundamentally. If there's no human to say that it's a cloud, does the cloud even know that it's a cloud? Obviously not. And so, of course, then it can't say that it should survive. Now imagine what happened a little bit later in the future, after this cloud died, is that some new form came into being for the very first time, and this form was different than all the other objects. This form had a desire to persist. It had a sense of itself. It could recognize its own form, separate itself out from the environment, and then try to maintain that form through manipulation. And so this shape, this form, lived significantly longer than all the other ones because it could manipulate. Like if wind blew at it, it could fly off to the side. If gravity pulled on it, it could maybe adjust itself and change itself to maintain its shape. And these, of course, became more successful, and uh, they lived longer. But eventually they also died, because there's only so much that you can man manipulate your environment until the game of manipulation is over, and eventually you disintegrate. That's, uh, that's life and death for you in a nutshell. Now, notice a couple of very key things here that many people overlook, even though they're so obvious, is that a form does not have to care about persisting. And that, in fact, there's nothing rational or logical about caring to persist as any particular form. Nobody tells you you have to persist. And also notice that for a form to persist at all, it must be able to distinguish itself and tell to itself what is it that is being persisted. So it has to crucially draw a distinction, the most fundamental distinction, 
the distinction between self and other. I am the form, and everything else is my environment. It's other to me. It's the world. Other forms, or the environment as a whole. And so what I have to do to maintain my sense of self is to now manipulate either myself or the environment, and usually both, in order to make sure that, that that distinction between self and other is maintained. Because as soon as that distinction is lost, what happens to me? Now, since a form, any form, is a part of the entire universe, it is never in full control of its destiny. Because just by the very definition that we created this distinction between self and other, there is an other, which is distinct from myself, which can hurt me or which can have a control over me. By definition, I can't control that other thing out there because it's not me. I define myself as that which I can control and manipulate. At least directly. And then maybe I can indirectly manipulate other forces. But see, so the, 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 the predicament that all life puts itself in is that it now has to play this game of defending itself against these external forces. And the reason it has to do that is because all forms are temporary and because reality is constantly changing. And that, that's a very important point about reality, is that it's constantly changing. No part of it is ever frozen or static for very long. And if any form totally changes, nothing of it basically remains because the form is what that thing was. That thing, whatever it is, this object that you're imagining, it doesn't have any existence to it other than the form that it is. So if we change that form too much, literally that change becomes its death. So what's being survived is the form. So fundamentally, survival is about maintaining a static arrangement of form, or you could say matter, or energy, or whatever you want to call it, a static arrangement within a sea of change. And survival is about maintaining order. And so disorder is an enemy of all living organisms. And disorder is your enemy as a human being. And in fact, one of the most dangerous things for an organism is freedom. People don't really understand the significance of what freedom is. They think freedom is a great thing. And they want to maximize freedom. But this is utterly impossible. You as an organism, just by the fact that you're alive, are committed to restricting freedom. Because if you were totally free, you would scatter into a million pieces, you would disintegrate, and you'd be dead. So literally, freedom is impossible for human beings limitation, intelligent limitation, is what life is all about. So these calls for unlimited freedom, this is just complete uh, nonsense, simplistic thinking. Freedom is what you're terrified of the most. And so the irony is, is that those people who call for maximum freedom, actually, um, they themselves are putting a lot of limitations on themselves and on life and on other people and on a society in order to maintain themselves. So there's, there's a deep hypocrisy there. But never mind, that's for another day. So, so basically, survival boils down to not changing. So in a certain sense, just by being alive, you're committing yourself to not changing. You're committing to freezing certain aspects of reality. And then what aspect of reality you wish to keep frozen, well, that, of course, depends on how you define yourself. What kind of form you think you are. Survival requires a distinction between self and other. This distinction is not given to you from the outside as an absolute. So you might think, like, well, Leah, I don't really know what's so profound about what you're saying here. Because, you know, yeah, there are objects in the world, and of course, they can get destroyed, and they can manipulate the environment, and they can live, so what's the big deal? <laughs> You're assuming objects. 
There ain't no such thing as objects, is what I'm trying to get you to understand. An object is something that you project onto the world. It doesn't exist as an absolute. So that cloud, it didn't really exist until you said it was a cloud. That's what's so profound about this. And of course, you, the form that comes into being, you get to say what you are because the universe doesn't tell you what you are. The universe doesn't define your identity. You're free to define your identity however you want. So you might say, well, Leo, but what about a baby? Like a baby is born and there it is. It's a baby. It's a human. I mean, what do you want? There it is. Isn't that just like a, a biological, physical fact? And what I'm telling you is, no, it's not. See, what you're doing there is you're looking at that baby and you're saying, a baby. That is something that you've constructed and projected onto it. Precisely because that's what you did when you were a baby. In order to be able to survive to the point where now you could call that thing a baby. You see? This is not just a physical issue. This is a metaphysical issue. Because nowhere in the universe is it written that that thing is a baby. You see? When you come into existence, you have no sense of distinction between yourself and the world. You don't know what you are because you haven't defined yourself. Now, people think that, well, but, but Leah, what definition could there be other than that I'm a baby and that I'm a human and that I grew up and became an adult? How else could have I defined myself? Well, actually, there are many other ways you could have defined yourself. And it's not just a, a matter of defining yourself physically as a human or not. It's uh, for humans, there's, there's a lot more complexity to how we define ourselves than just physically. Your physical definition is just a tiny um, tip of the iceberg of your self-definition. And really, in this series, we're going to be much more interested in the other ways in which you define yourself beyond your physical definitions. Although, of course, your physical definitions are all constructed by you. You constructed your physical definition, and you have actually separated yourself from your environment such that you now think that's real and that's physical, when in fact, that's purely mental and conceptual. So you created this conceptual distinction. Self and other, or self and world, are created in a single slice, in a single step. So what we ultimately have at the biggest picture is we have an infinite field of consciousness. That's what reality is, an infinite field of consciousness. And then within that, by creating this distinction between self and other, you create a virtual partition. It's not an actual partition. You didn't actually divide consciousness in two. It's a virtual partition. I use this concept of virtual partitions because I like it from, uh, from creating hard drive partitions. You know, if you're formatted a hard drive, you can create multiple partitions on there. And it's just a single hard drive, but then you can subdivide it into as many parts as you want. That's exactly what's happening within the universe. That's how objects are coming into being, through virtual partitions. And then their death is the elimination of the virtual partition. And if you eliminate all the virtual partitions, all you're left with is the oneness of the original hard drive. So imagine an, infinite, uh, imagine an infinite hard drive with an infinite number of virtual partitions of which you yourself are one. And so you came into existence when one of these virtual partitions was created. And that's when you looked at yourself and you said, oh, I am this. And whatever you thought this was is what you became. So what survival is at the biggest picture level is it's the maintaining of virtual partition within infinite consciousness. That's what you're doing here in the world. That's life. You're maintaining this partition. Now, notice about this partition, it's not a simple line that you draw like this between you and the environment. And notice when you draw one line, you're creating two parts. See, you draw one line, one division, creating two parts, self and other. But this line, when a human draws this line, it's very complicated. It's not a simple uh, vertical line. It's a squiggly, complicated, messy, chaotic line. This line is unique for every human being. And this line is what is being survived 
so to speak. And if this line changes too much, you either become a new human being, that would be growth, or you actually die. So the distinction between self and other is what's creating the survival drive. But conversely, because it's a two-way street, the imperative to survive as a form is what creates the distinction between self and other. So these two are working simultaneously, sort of a chicken and egg problem, which came first. They both feed into each other. So here's a key insight for you, one of many about survival that I'll be underscoring. This is the first one. What's being survived is not a physical object, the way that people imagine, the way that science imagines, the way the materialist paradigm imagines. Rather, what's being survived is a conceptual boundary, a fantasy. That's why I call it a virtual partition to distinguish it from an actual partition. So you are a virtual being in a certain sense. That doesn't mean you're living in a computer simulation. It just means that your sense of self is a virtual thing. And that survival is largely, especially for humans, a conceptual activity, not merely a physical activity. So from now on, when I say the word survival, I want you to radically broaden your understanding of that word. It doesn't just mean getting food and sex and shelter the way that people imagine. It means something much deeper and broader than that. It means surviving as a conceptual self, as a distinction from your environment, which is not necessarily just food and shelter and water. There's a lot more that goes into that, especially for humans, because we're very complex creatures. And we'll be breaking that down into more detail as we go on here. See, I want you to consider the possibility that without a sense of self or you, you might cut off your own leg and eat it for breakfast because you wouldn't know that it's inappropriate to eat your own leg because you might not consider your leg a part of who you are. And therefore, it's appropriate for you to now eat it in order to feed yourself. See, now that sounds kind of silly. You might say, well, Leo, that, that, that doesn't happen in real life. Um, but don't take for granted that your leg is, is essential to your identity. In a certain situation, you might cut off your leg in order to escape and to live. See? Maybe you might even, in a certain situation, cut off your leg and eat it in order to survive. But uh, regardless, it's not clear at all that your leg is a part of you. See, people assume that science... gives us physical objects and identities. But the thing they overlook is that science cannot actually identify anything because identification is not an objective scientific fact. It's not a given. It's something that you create. So even for a scientist to go out into the field and to identify some creature, a monkey, or even a physical object like a rock, See, the scientist has to project that onto the world because otherwise he wouldn't be able to distinguish a rock from a, from a tree, from a monkey. He's doing that. But of course, he's not conscious that he's doing that. He's assuming that what he's doing is actually part of the physical world when it's not. And in fact, physical world is a distinction he's made himself and has projected onto this infinite field of consciousness. So it's quite tricky. Don't assume that science tells you what things are or gives you identities because it doesn't because identity is totally subjective and in a sense arbitrary. I also want you to consider that there's nothing rational, logical, or objective about survival. In fact, just the opposite. Survival is a highly irrational, subjective activity. Survival doesn't care about reason or logic, survival co-opts reason and logic in order to survive. Because you see, when you put yourself in this very life and death predicament of maintaining your sense of self, that's 
the most fundamental value that you have. Nothing matters to you but being able to live because nothing else can matter unless you, your life is maintained, you see? So for the organism, the organism can't really care about logic or rationality or truth or objectivity because it's committed to the irrational activity of maintaining itself given any means possible. You see, only later after that, if it is able to maintain itself successfully, only then can it sit back, uh, sip a pita colada on the beach and think about some philosophical notion of truth or rationality or logic. See, only if it's safe can it do that, not when it's under threat. Just the notion that you should survive is already predicated upon falsehood and illusion. Because, see, to get yourself to buy into this whole game of trying to survive, and, you know, survival takes a lot of energy and effort. It's exhausting, if you haven't noticed. So you have to trick yourself into believing that it's important, because if you didn't think that survival is important, well, you wouldn't try to survive, and therefore you wouldn't probably be here thinking about survival. So you have to believe that survival is the most important thing. You have to be terrified to death of it, which is literally what death is to you. Why you're so scared of death and why you avoid death at every possible turn. Because to you, this is not a game. You've managed to trick yourself into thinking that this is serious. This is important. And so, of course, you never questioned the obvious. You never questioned whether actually maybe dying is totally fine and there's no problem, and that maybe survival wasn't important at all, and that maybe survival was totally irrational, and the rational choice would be just to lay down and die. See, you can't even consider that possibility. You'll say, oh, Leo, but that's so unreasonable. That's, that's crazy talk. You're just talking crazy. Now this is dangerous. Exactly. See, you don't even want to open your mind to these possibilities because they're so threatening to you. Because you don't care about truth or rationality or fairness or equality. You don't care about any of this shit. What you care about is your own ass surviving. See? And that itself is falsehood and highly irrational. So your sense of self, of course, co-opts rationality. And so really the way that you use rationality is whatever serves your survival is what you call rational. That's really how you define survival. Because it doesn't make sense for you to have a notion of rationality in which your survival could be a low value priority. That wouldn't be rational to you. Of course not, because you've hijacked rationality to survive. Because otherwise, why do you even care about rationality? You don't. You only care about rationality because you've made an identity out of it. Ta-da. For you rationalists out there. But I don't want to digress too much on that. So the key point here is that how you define yourself determines what must survive. Anything that's part of your identity or self-concept automatically becomes important and must be survived. Threat and danger are not real objective things. Threat and danger are relative to however you define yourself. So for example, let's say that for, uh, for you and I, if we're not rabid, zealous Christians, if, if you take a Bible and you throw it into the fireplace, I wouldn't react. I wouldn't really care. You probably wouldn't either. But if we take a, a, like a serious, hardcore, zealous Christian who really believes in the Bible, grew up with the Bible, considers it a holy book, maybe has a Bible that his grandfather passed down to, to him over the ages, and it's important to him. He's underlined it, and he has important passages in there that help him with his life and all this. See, to him, if you take that Bible and you throw it in the fireplace, you know, that's going to be a serious threat and danger to him, and he's going to react very emotionally, get very upset, might even cry, might even, uh, you know, become violent and murderous for you doing this. Why? What's the difference? 
The only difference is that he's created an identity out of that Bible. See, he's attached to it. It's important to him. Why is it important to him? Precisely because it's wedded to his sense of survival. It helps him to survive. Now, here's the mistake that people make is they think, but, but Leo, how does a Bible, a Bible is just full of, uh, of philosophy and silly superstitious ideas. How can that help with survival? He's deluded. Actually, it's you who's deluded. What you don't understand is that what's being survived by this Christian is not his physical body. It's his identification with being a Christian. It's that Christian self-image. That is the thing that's the most important. That is what we call the ego. That is what we call the sense of self with a lowercase s. See? And you have one of those as well. It's just a question of what is that for you? So for you, throwing a Christian Bible in, into a fireplace probably would, would not upset you, but there probably is something of yours that I could throw in the fireplace that would upset you very much. Maybe your baby, you see. Now you say, ah, Leo, but my baby, that's my biological uh, offspring, and that's very important. Everybody knows that babies are important. You don't, just don't throw babies in the fireplace. That's ridiculous. Of course I get upset. No, 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 not of course, not of course. You will only get upset if you hold this baby to be part of your survival. And that's not the case. You know, some mothers will uh, dispose of their babies because they don't want them. See, so it's all about how you define what you are if you define yourself as being a father or a good mother, then of course you need to protect that self-image. And so of course you can't let your baby get hurt. If in your mind you're telling yourself, oh, this baby is my baby and my baby is more important than all the other babies in the world. Is that really rational? Of course not. There's no reason that your baby is more important than all the other babies. It's complete hogwash. You made it up. You made it up. Now you say, oh, Leo, but, but I'm related to my baby. My baby has my genes. All human beings are related to each other. We're all basically brothers and sisters. If you look at our genetic code, we're so similarly related that there's really no reason why you should care more for your baby surviving than for uh, some other baby surviving. It doesn't matter. You're just totally selfish and you're completely blind to your own selfishness and you're completely in denial about your own selfishness precisely because you're engaged in survival, blind survival. So see, I want you to see that threat and danger are not absolute things. It depends on what you need to survive. So what is a threat and a danger to one person or one nation will actually be a boon to another and will actually promote the survival of another. You know, to a very scientifically minded nation, science, that's, that's great. That's not a threat. It's not a danger. But when you have a theocracy, Science becomes a great threat and danger. See, that's the relativity of survival. Survival is extremely relative and people don't understand that. People, because they're so selfish and so blindly selfish, they just assume that, well, if it's good for me, it's good for everybody. <laughs> no. <laughs> and if it's bad for me, it's bad for everybody. Again, no, not at all. It depends on what you are, how you define yourself to be. And all of us define ourselves in very different ways. Of course, there's also a lot of commonalities. Also, another fundamental point about survival I want you to understand is that for a thing to be, it has to be a particular way, a very, very particular way. For a thing to be one way is for it not to be some other way. So for example, let's take table salt. For table salt to be table salt, it cannot be pepper, sugar, earth, metal, plastic, wood, gold, and a million other things. Because as soon as salt becomes pepper, it's as though the salt was killed and pepper was born. See? So what I want you to really understand about this is to be an object, to be a particular thing, there's a zero-sum game going on here. Because you can only exist as you if you're not existing as something that's not you. See, the two are being defined at the same time. And so to be 
one particular way, you're necessarily excluding actually an infinite number of other ways that you could have been. And that's very important to understand. So, for example, when you were born, to be born, a billion other sperm had to die because only one sperm could have fertilized that egg, and that was you. You got very lucky. You won the lottery. See, But all those other sp sperms had to die. Now, of course, you're completely oblivious to this, and you don't care at all. But from the point of view of all those other billion sperms, they, they all lost the game, and they all died. All right, so you have to under, uh, uh, really appreciate this delicate trade-off that happens. And one of the most amazing things that blows my mind about reality is that even though reality itself as a whole is absolute infinity, it's totally infinite, and it has no limitations whatsoever, there are still zero-sum dynamics within this infinity. There are real trade-offs. There is competition over limited resources. Life is impossible, therefore, without death. Forms must feast off other forms. And this is extremely fundamental to reality. And the reason this must happen is because there's only one reality. And so it can't leach energy from anywhere but from itself. See? So it's all about how do you partition this one hard drive. We only have one hard drive. Now, it's an infinite hard drive. But when we create these partitions, we necessarily make choices about what is and what is not allowed to exist within the world of form. See, there's trade-offs depending on how you draw that partition line. And uh, what I like to say here is a little joke kind of example is that a squirrel does not know that it is an oak murdering machine. But that's exactly what a squirrel is. See, the squirrel lives its whole life completely oblivious to the fact that it's murdered thousands of acorns, which were supposed to turn into mature oak trees. So in a sense, it's, it's, a, it's an oak baby killing machine. But the squirrel doesn't know or care about any of this. And the squirrel needs to behave this way in order to be a squirrel. Otherwise, it couldn't exist. See? And if all those acorns turned into mature oak trees, all the squirrels would be dead because there would be nothing for them to eat. See? So notice that trade-off because what I want to tell you is that you are just like that squirrel. You've been running around your whole life engaged in survival activities, extremely selfish and devilish ones, uh, wrecking havoc on your environment without a single thought about what's really going on and what, is, what you're really doing. So think about how you are just like that squirrel. Now let's uh, shift from sort of the, the lofty, <laughs> big picture metaphysics of survival into the nitty gritty down to earth, because you're probably wondering, well, Leo, but how is this useful for my own self-improvement? Of course, notice that's already a survival question. You see? The very project of improving yourself, fixing problems that you have, is already thoroughly permeated by survival. You see? You see the problem here? How are you going to transcend yourself when all of your thinking and all of your desiring is all about preserving yourself? All you really care about is preserving yourself, and yet to develop and to grow yourself, you need to let go of yourself and transcend yourself. You see how you're getting in your own way? Just to be able to change a behavior of yours, a part of you has to die. Because to change a behavior means that some old behavior you had now has to not exist anymore. But of course, that old behavior, because it's a part of your psyche and your mind and your brain, it's fighting to maintain itself and to survive, which is why it's so hard for you to kick bad habits, why you keep backsliding, why you keep not getting results, you see? Because actually, you're very conflicted about this whole uh, project of changing yourself. Because on the one hand, you tell yourself that you want to change yourself, and you want to be a better person, and you want to be happier and all this. 
But on the other hand, you don't want to change. You want to stay exactly as you were. So really what you, what you want is you want the results of the change without having to change yourself. And that is the entire problem with traditional self-help and why most self-help doesn't really produce significant results in people's lives is because what they're doing is they're trying to change themselves without actually changing themselves. And so the only way that you will actually be able to truly get massive results in your life is actually if you're willing to bite the bullet and to actually change who you are. Identity level change, which involves facing your death. Which, of course, nobody wants to do because the thing you're fighting your whole life is death. You see? So, to liberate yourself and to get to the highest levels of human potential, you need to do the most counterintuitive thing possible, which is to face your own death and to go straight into it. Straight into the abyss, the belly of the whale, which is exactly what nobody wants to do. So, of course, it's no accident that almost nobody in society is very highly developed because it's so counterintuitive and it goes against uh, almost all your instincts because your instincts are there to help you to be selfish and to survive. Anyways, let's get into the nitty gritty. Your life is completely dominated by survival. I want you to notice this. Every little thing that you do is what I'm talking about. So let me give you a long list of examples to help you to become aware of this. Reading a book, wiping your ass, taking a shower, drinking coffee, going to the grocery store, going to school, watching makeup videos on YouTube for you ladies, taking your vitamins and nootropics in the morning, scratching an itch on your face. What is all of this stuff but survival? Why would you do any of this stuff other than that it served your survival? You wouldn't. In fact, what I want you to realize is that you do nothing in your life which doesn't somehow serve your survival. Now, the deeper question is, what exactly is it that you're surviving? Yes, of course, your physical body, but uh, I mean more than that. Because your, your survival activities go way beyond your physical body. You might wonder, well, Leo, you said reading a book. The first thing you said is reading a book. How is reading a book survival? Well, why do you read a book? Take a look at it. You read a book because you think you're going to find some good information there, some important technique that's going to change your life, maybe help you to develop a better career, learn some new skill that helps you to survive. Why do you need that career? To survive. Now you want to say, oh, Leo, but... Uh, but, you know, I, I like to read nonfiction books, science fiction and so forth. I mean, sorry, yeah, I, I like to read fiction books like, like science fiction. So in that case, uh, how is that survival? That's just entertainment. But, but what is entertainment but survival? Entertainment is crucial to your ability to survive. And also a lot of people who read fiction books, they develop a whole identity around it. So, for example, let's say you like science fiction books. You enjoy them. They give you pleasure. They relax your mind from a hard day's work. So maybe you spent the whole week working, and, and now you, you get to the weekend, and you just want to chill, chill out and uh, grab your favorite sci-fi book and just kind of read it on the couch and enjoy yourself. That's survival. See? Because if we made you work nonstop every single day without giving you some break or some rest or some entertaining activities, like your favorite sci-fi books, then eventually you get depressed and frustrated. You might even kill yourself because you need that outlet to recharge your batteries, to refresh yourself, to recharge your spirit. You see, survival is happening on many levels simultaneously. It's happening on the physical level. It's happening on the mental level, the emotional level. It's happening at the spiritual level, all of it simultaneously. And you have various levels of needs that are simultaneously being satisfied. And of course, sometimes they get into conflict with one another. But even more importantly, think of someone who really loves sci-fi. They've actually developed a whole identity around it. See, they probably have like actually developed a, a connection with their sci-fi books, such that if we take their whole bookshelf of sci-fi books and throw it in the fire, 
they're going to be very upset about it because they have an emotional attachment to it because those books have maybe helped them to, to figure out parts of their life or get through difficult, challenging times through a bad breakup or something. Those books, you know, they're attached to them or they have various kinds of fantasies about sci-fi or whatever. And then these books help to feed those fantasies. So what's being survived in this case is not merely uh, the human body or brain. It, it's, it's that whole identity that you create. It's all the software. Like, if you think of yourself as a sci-fi fan, there you go. Or maybe you're reading these sci-fi books because you plan to become a sci-fi author yourself. And so to you, it's actually, it's like a career thing as well. And so that's important. Of course, that's, that's also survival. So all of this is survival. I want you to notice that survival is very detailed. Like the devil, it's all in the details. It's not that you're just doing stuff vaguely to survive. No, no, no. You're doing extremely specific things to survive. And you're not just doing it like once or twice throughout the day. I'm saying that like within a, a five minute span of your day, you do at least a hundred different survival activities. And each one of those, you can break those down into like little chunks such that every two seconds, you're doing some new survival thing that's helping you to reach larger survival goals. So it's very nested, right? You have like very large survival goals that might take you years to accomplish. Like you might have a goal to buy a house for which you have a career, for which you study books, for which right now, you know, you're, you're reading a particular book. And so all of those kind of are like a chain of survival activities, which are ultimately get you to your house that you want. Now, of course, most of the stuff that you're doing, most of your survival strategies, as I call them, are completely uh, unconscious to you. You don't really know what you're doing because you're just behaving like a robot. But nevertheless, they're still there. So let's continue with this list. Getting annoyed by a noise. That's survival. Because if you get too much noise in your ear, it might hurt your ears or it just might annoy you enough that it will drive you crazy. See, so what you're doing there by when you're getting annoyed by a noise is actually you're preventing yourself from going crazy because it's that annoyance that then gets you to shut off the noise or put on some headphones, go in the other room, yell at your family members to keep the noise down, whatever. See, so that annoyance is your survival strategy to then manipulate the environment to turn off the noise. Or you could manipulate yourself to tune out the noise. That could also work. See, there's many different survival strategies. In fact, millions and trillions and trillions upon trillions of different survival strategies. So uh, I'm just giving you a little list here, tiny, tiny list. Fiddling with your thermostat to get the temperature just right in your room. That's survival. Getting comfortable in your seat. Speaking of which, I should do that right now. <laughs> That's survival. Checking the clock, checking your smartphone, wearing socks, watching TV, calling your mother, shopping for designer clothes, wearing a Rolex, buying a yacht. Now, I specifically included some of these luxury items on this list because sometimes people get it in their, in their skull that survival is only meeting your basic necessities. And they might say, well, Leo, but how, buying a yacht, this is not survival. Come on, don't be silly. Nobody really needs a yacht. Now, this is a very important point, so listen closely. A lot of poor people, and by poor people, I mean people uh, under a million dollars in net worth, they don't understand uh, how survival works for rich people. Because they think you, you, you're, you're still under the illusion that if you get enough money, then survival will be taken care of and you'll be happy. This is, of course, a complete pipe dream. It doesn't work this way. Here's how it really works. Because what you're really surviving is not some physical body, but your own self-concept and self-image and ego. It doesn't really matter how much money you have because there's no end to how much your ego can need or want. So here's how it really works. So when you're poor, like if you're only earning uh, $20,000 a year, then for you, buying a loaf of bread might be a struggle sometimes or just paying your electricity bill. And you're like, it's a matter of kind of like survival need and life and death to pay your electricity bill because you don't want to be uh, home without the lights on, you see. Um, 
And so you, for you, it's like, it's very important. You take it very seriously to pay your electric bill every month. And then when you think about some millionaire, let's say a guy with a hundred million dollars, he wants to buy himself a yacht. You say, well, that's very frivolous. But to him, buying that yacht is as important as to you getting your electricity bill paid. You see that? Because he's playing the survival game at a very different level than you are when you're poor. For him, he's already got his basic needs all met. He's already got five different houses all around the world, and he's got a bunch of fancy clothes and all this, and he's got a bunch of fancy cars, and so none of that is a challenge for him. He's surviving the image of himself, not his physical body, the image of himself. And for this guy with $100 million, his image is that he needs, needs to have a yacht like all his friends do. Because if he doesn't have a yacht, then he's lesser than his friends, and they're going to laugh behind his back and think that he's poor and all this sorts of stuff, right? So for him, it's it's just as important as for you a loaf of bread is. See? Going further down the list, how about shopping for panties at Victoria's Secret? You would think, well, panties, these, these lun la uh, lingerie panties, are they really that important? Does it really matter? Hell yeah, it matters. For the woman, it matters because these panties are packaging one of her most important assets, survival-wise, survival you see. So if she can present herself in a nice way to a guy with these panties, gets him to fall in love with her, gets, gets him really attracted to her, then he might marry her. Then he might be a good lover and a good provider, and they'll have children a whole life together. So it's not just about her getting resources from the guy. It can also be about love and romance and all of this good stuff. All of that is survival. All of it. See? Now, when she goes into the store to buy the panties uh, to impress the guy, is she conscious of all of this? Is that what she is? She th is she thinking 20 years down the road about how, oh, these panties will help me to, to, to lock this guy in and then he'll marry me and then, and then, We'll have a bunch of money and babies together. <laughs> like, no, she's not thinking about it like that. This is all completely subconscious. Completely subconscious. Nevertheless, it's happening. And in fact, and here's another very imp important point, is that we, we, del we delude ourselves with false rationalizations about our survival strategies. So... In this case, with these panties, she might say, oh, but Leo, I'm just buying these panties for me. It's not really for the guy. I'm not a want anything. I'm just buying them to look sexy for myself. Yeah, you can tell yourself that, but there's, there's actually what's going on under the surface that you got to look at. You see, survival, especially human survival, is a very devious, sneaky, underhanded sort of thing. It's not honest. Because honesty doesn't help you to survive very well. Dishonesty, manipulation, subterfuge, double meanings and ulterior motives and purposes. This is what helps you to survive in the competitive marketplace in the doggy -dog, dog world that we're in. But of course, see, the problem is, is that you also have an idea of yourself as being a good, honest person. So how do you balance out the idea, the self-image of you being a good, honest person on the one hand. On the other hand, you need to manipulate and scheme and engage in all sorts of subterfuge and manipulation to uh, give yourself a survival advantage. Well, what you do is you brainwash yourself into thinking that all of the subterfuge and lying and manipulation that you do, that all of that is totally normal and actually good. It's good, it's logical, it's reasonable, and it's actually not dishonest. This is the game that's being played. And you and your mind are right in the middle of it. Your thoughts and your emotions are right in the middle of it. This is what you're engaged in all day long. Lying, manipulating, scheming, trying to find every advantage possible to get whatever you think you need. And it doesn't matter what it is. It could be food. It could be sex, it could be a house, it could be just a self-image. Maybe you just want to be a, a good, noble Christian woman. 
that's going to be the thing that you're going to be surviving. And if that's your self-image, then you're going to be doing all the good, noble, uh, womanly Christian stuff that that person needs to do to be that way. And anything which disrupts that will be very threatening to you because it's literally threatening your life as that thing that you think you are. Going on with the list, masturbation, sex, of course, these are all survival activities, giving gifts at Christmas, smiling on a stranger and being polite. What do you think that's all about? Purely survival. Caring about what people think of you, this is all survival. Worrying about your physical appearance. Cheating, stealing, arguing, debating, all survival activities. Calling people names. Defending your culture or your religion. This is an automatic robotic survival activity. Driving an electric car or being a vegan or being a spiritual person or giving to charity. These are good examples because a lot of times people think that, well, if I'm giving to charity or Leo, if I'm being a vegan, then that's not about my survival. In fact, it's the opposite. I'm, I'm, being, I'm being generous and I'm being selfless by being a vegan, Leo, because, you know, I'm not, I'm not killing animals the way all those other people are. Yeah, that's called pure selfish survival for you because you have a self-image of being this, this noble vegan who's saving animals. See? And just me telling you that your veganism is a survival activity already starts to upset you, makes you triggered and emotional and defensive, and all of a sudden your mind now starts to, no, Leo, what are you talking about? No, I'm actually helping. You don't understand, Leo, you're deluded. Leo, are you a vegan? Oh, see, you're eating, oh, look, you're, look how many animals you've killed. See? See what your mind is doing to defend yourself? Yeah, it's very tricky. Very tricky. This is why this work is so difficult. Because all of the most important truths that need to be told to you and taught to you, you resist. Because all of them are completely threatening to the way that you live your whole life and to yourself. And so you actively resist this waking up process, this growing up process. Taking your dog for a walk is a survival activity. Logging into your online bank account, checking your email, installing software on your computer, dreaming up some new business ideas, doodling in your notebook in class when you're bored. What does that do? That entertains you from all the boredom. That boredom would kill you <laughs> if you let it last long enough. Cracking a joke, getting a tattoo, listening to music. You know, the tattoo thing is very interesting because people who are really into tattoos, they just keep getting them and getting them and getting them. You know, some of those people, it's a whole identity thing for them. The whole tattoo subculture is, uh, is, you know, is its own very unique kind of identity that you create with these tattoos. And it becomes sort of like your life. Maybe you've met some of these people. See, are they conscious of why they're doing it? No, of course not. They're just behaving like robots. Now, of course, this doesn't mean that getting a tattoo is good or bad. Make sure that you don't uh, misunderstand me here. All these things that I'm talking about, I'm not judging any of them. I'm not telling you that you should stop doing any of these things. We're just pointing out why you're doing them. We just want to notice why we do stuff. We just want to watch ourselves behaving like robots and chimps so that we can become more conscious. We're not interested in changing anything yet. We just want to observe. Listening to music is survival. Getting high on weed, going to a fancy dinner party, socializing with your friends, taking out the trash, caring about your family and children. Well, that's a big one. That's huge. That's a huge part of your survival. And most people do not want to admit that all of their family activities and children and all the thoughts and emotions that are related to that has anything to do with survival. But of course it does, which is why it's so problematic for you. There's so much tension there. Getting a tan, attending church is survival. Being a Christian, being a Muslim, being a Hindu, being a Jew, any kind of religious identity that you have is all purely robotic survival that you're doing. Golf is survival. Saving pennies at the gas station, survival.
buying anything at all is survival. Being depressed is survival. And now we get to the really important and huge categories. All judgments of any kind whatsoever are a survival activity. You only do them because you have an ego to defend. If you didn't have a self to defend, you wouldn't judge anything. All meaning whatsoever that you have created, and you did create all of it, is a survival activity. If you didn't have a sense of self that needed to survive, nothing would have any meaning whatsoever. Meaning is a survival tool. Your mind generates meaning in order for you to know which things to pursue and which things to avoid, depending on how they fit with your survival agenda. You see, meanings are how you know whether something is going to be beneficial to your survival or not. Those things which are not beneficial or are irrelevant to you are meaningless. And those things which are beneficial and serve your survival the most, those are very meaningful for you. And of course, all of that is completely relative, depending on how you've defined yourself. All thinking is survival activity. Justifying, rationalizing, creating stories and narratives, all beliefs, all logic and reason, complaining, thinking up ideas, fantasizing, imagination, philosophy, any theories you have, scientific thinking, this is all survival activity. Why else would you be doing it? All speech is survival activity. And then we come to perhaps the most important and trickiest category of all, which is all emotions. I'm talking about fear, anger, sadness, happiness, excitement, arousal, embarrassment, disgust, frustration, boredom, jealousy, desire, craving, suffering, pain. All of these are how you survive. How you manipulate yourself to survive. These are the internal levers that you are pulling to manipulate yourself into relationship with the environment such that you could survive. And without this mechanism, you'd be dead very fast. So it's a very complicated a uh, messy nest of, of tangled cords, this whole domain of emotions. And it governs and runs your entire life. All feelings of discomfort are about survival. Are you feeling comfortable in your chair right now? I know I'm not. What is that feeling of discomfort on your ass when you're sitting on a chair? It's a, it's a signal that helps you to move your ass and get yourself more comfortable. Because otherwise, you would make, might damage your ass, might damage your body, something like that. Uh, also, to conclude this list, politics, religion, science, business, war, celebrity and fame, status, money, and resource distribution, fairness, justice, ethics, and morality, all of this is about survival. You see, so there's a lot here, and we're still just scratching the surface. All of this is survival activity, and you are engaged in all of it all the time, every second of your life. But you're not conscious of why you're doing these things. You're just doing these things because you don't even know any other way to live. Survival has completely dominated and taken over your life. Survival has co-opted your entire emotional system, your belief system, your worldview, and your reason. such that you can't think straight, you can't feel straight, you can't see reality straight, because all of that had to be co-opted, corrupted, and distorted in order for you to be able to be you. Because if you saw reality as it actually is, you couldn't be you. You'd be dead.
So in a nutshell, you are a survival robot. And you are just now starting to see the tip of the iceberg of how much of a robot you are. And you have no idea how to change yourself or what to do about this. That's okay. <laughs> we'll help you as we keep going. For now, don't worry about changing it or stopping it. Rather, worry more about becoming aware of it. Your ability to change all these things is directly dependent upon your ability to be aware of it. And there's a lot of it to be aware of here. You could spend the next five years studying all the stuff that I just listed. And you still wouldn't be totally aware of all the stuff that's going on with that, uh, within, within your life, which is survival. Here's a really important key insight for you. Take a note on this. Survival is deeply intelligent. Stop thinking of survival as a dumb mechanical process. It isn't. Survival is subtle, non-linear, and full of sleight of hand, trickery, and deception. Survival knows no shame. It will go to any cost and any length in order to win. Survival is extremely elaborate, uh, elaborate and sophisticated. The sophistication of survival, when you start to really study it and to see it in action, is just jaw-dropping at how sophisticated it is, especially within humans. Extremely sophisticated survival strategies humans invent in order to maintain themselves within the environments that they find themselves in. And here's what people don't understand is that there are so many different environments in which humans live. And I'm not just talking about mountains and deserts and tropical islands. I'm talking about social environments because humans primarily, in order to survive, we need to survive in a social environment, even more so than a physical one. So humans invent very elaborate social survival strategies. And then they, they, they work their whole lives to maintain those without having a clue of why they did it or what they're doing. And because they don't have a clue of why they did it or what they're doing, uh, they're not free to change it. And in fact, what they do is they dig in their heels like a stubborn ass and they refuse to budge. And this is where the problem of closed-mindedness comes in is that people are so closed-minded because they don't want to change because they found their little niche in life, whatever it is, whatever your niche is, whether you're a, a corporate lawyer working for ExxonMobil or you're an assistant to the president of the United States or you're some anchor on Fox News or you're some smear merchant uh, conspiracy theorist YouTuber who puts out videos or you run a tabloid magazine or you're some corporate CEO of of Google or Apple or whatever, you found your little niche and now you're defending that little niche and you don't want to change it. You don't want to know anything beyond that little niche because that little niche is that perfect fit between you and your environment that you're trying to maintain desperately. And this is what closes you up and prevents you from really being free in life because you're so attached to your survival strategies. In fact, your survival strategies are literally baked into your physical brain, the neurons baked into it from, from birth, from childhood. And many of your survival strategies are extremely dysfunctional, but they were baked into your, into your brain and into your mind so early in your life because of the tough situations and environments that you were in. Maybe you were in an abusive household Maybe your parents were alcoholics. Maybe it was a tough neighborhood you grew up in, some, some ghetto or in the hood somewhere, and you had to be tough to, to, you know, to, to survive. Or maybe you had to steal when you were younger because there just wasn't money in the family. Or maybe you came from a, a poor country where you had to do some, um, some shady stuff to get by. Maybe you had to lie. Maybe you had to manipulate. Maybe you had to extort. Maybe you had to bribe. Maybe you even had to kill people. Maybe you have to kill animals. Yeah. All that's survival. That's how humans survive.
There's nothing just or fair about it. It's just raw selfishness. And most survival strategies are unconscious. You don't even know that it's a strategy. You don't just sit down one day as a child and come up with a strategy like, I'm going to lie to to every new boyfriend that I have. You don't do that. It's not like that. It's like, no, you're growing up in this environment where lying in your family is just constant between your mother and your father. Then you just pick up on it and just gets ingrained into how you think life can only be lived is that way through lying all the time. And you notice that your mother's always lying to your father and so forth. And then you just pick that up and then you keep doing that with all the boyfriends that you get. Yeah, that's your survival strategy. And survival strategies, when they're unconscious, the problem, you might think, well, Leo, survival's great because it keeps me alive. Not necessarily. Because when you take your selfishness and your survival, just hog wild, no holds barred, it actually tends to circle back around, backfire on itself, and actually cause you a lot of misery, suffering, and um, can even uh, end in depression and suicide and all sorts of terrible things. Addictions of various kinds. See? Because to really be good at life, you need to do survival in a conscious manner. Most people are doing survival in an unconscious manner. So it's not that I'm saying that survival is a terrible thing. Be careful not to judge survival here. I'm not judging it. I'm just trying to make you more aware of just what you're doing. We're just observing here. That's all we're doing. We're not judging anything. Now, here's a really important point. What's being survived is the mind or the psyche when we're talking about humans. That's really where most of our work here has to happen. And this is a very specific thing, your psyche. It has unique psychic needs, attractions, and aversions. Think of the psyche like a ghost which has taken over the machine that is your body. This ghost is inside of you pulling various levers. Every lever that it pulls is to maintain itself. That's the ghost's game. And if it doesn't pull the right combination of levers, the ghost will die. And that's what you are right now. When I'm talking to you, I'm pointing to you. You're that ghost. You, that thing that you think you are, that thing you think was born. That human that's sitting there right now listening to this, that's the ghost I'm talking about inside your skull. That ghost that you believe that you are. Of course, there's no real ghost there. There's nothing there. But you believe you are that ghost. You have an image of yourself and so forth. And so me just telling you that you don't exist is not going to change anything for you. You still believe you exist, this ghost. You believe you're important. You believe you're the most important thing. And so your, your entire life is just a game of maintaining that ghost. This ghost, of course, not only has to look out for physical dangers, obviously, but this ghost must look out for psychic dangers as well. Like, for example, contradictions within its own worldview. That's a serious threat to this ghost. Worldview is a very important thing for this ghost. Other things that the ghost must look out for, these psychic dangers, are it must maintain a positive self-narrative. It must think that it's the hero. It must think that it's the good guy. Because if the ghost ever starts to think of itself as a devil or the bad guy, that's going to be very painful and problematic for the ghost. It's going to have to change its ways. It can't maintain itself that way. So the ghost needs to maintain a positive self-image. The ghost must justify all of its actions to itself towards that end so that it appears to be an angel to itself. Which is, of course, very self-serving because what you're doing is you're taking all your selfishness and you're calling that um, goodness. You're taking all of your devilry and you're calling that goodness. Uh, also, the ghost must feel right and good and certain and not confused, which is why it needs beliefs in order to eliminate uncertainty and confusion. So, of course, this ghost adopts a bunch of beliefs and clings to them incorporates all these beliefs into itself so that literally the body of the ghost is made up of beliefs and worldviews, which is precisely why people are so close-minded to changing them. This ghost must make sense of the world, must explain the world to itself in a cohesive manner. Otherwise, it might go insane. 
and it won't be able to manipulate the world effectively if its models of the world aren't very good. At the same time, this ghost has so many flawed models of the world that it's really put itself in a serious bind because on the one hand, its models are so ineffective and so dysfunctional and obviously untrue. On the other hand, it's attached to its models, so it can't give up its models because if I, if I give up my, my, my models, my scientific models, my Christian, Islamic models, whatever models I got, if I give up all those, then I'll be dead as this ghost because my body is made up of these things as the ghost in the machine. See? So this is why people get stuck with very dysfunctional worldviews. You would think like, well, if they're dysfunctional, then they, they hinder survival. And therefore, it would be very easy, Leo, to just shed them. No, you couldn't be more wrong. Because what you're underestimating is the extent to which your identity is fused with your models and belief systems such that you would rather operate for the rest of your life on a dysfunctional and untrue model of the world which actually harms you physically or mentally rather than admit that your model of the world is wrong and to change it. That for you would be the greater evil or at least for most people. This ghost must also look out and pre preempt external threats. These threats can be physical but also not physical, psychological. And it must keep itself motivated too so that it can survive some more another day. <clears throat> I want you to especially notice your survival at the micro level. This is where really you're going to grow from this conversation. I want you to monitor every tiny thing that you do all day long, sometimes even minute by minute, and check how it relates to your survival. So you're blowing your nose one minute, Look at that. How does that relate to your survival? How is that helping you to survive? You're scratching your ass the next minute. How about that? You're fueling up your car. Well, that's survival. You're driving to the store. That's survival. You're texting a friend. That's survival. Notice all those little things. Even within that one incident where you're sending your friend a text message, notice which letters you're typing in and notice how every letter and every word that you're typing into that message Every thought about what you're, you're supposed to say in this message is all survival. That's how granular I want you to get with this, right? We got to get really granular so you really see it happening in your life. This is not theory. This is not a philosophy of mine. This is something you're doing all the time. If you've been listening to me and having various kinds of objections, notice that. What is that? That's your ghost surviving. Maybe it's disagreeing with some of the stuff I'm saying. Or maybe you're agreeing. That's also survival. If you're saying, oh, yes, yes, Leo, what you're saying is so true. This is so helpful. This is so good for me. Oh, my God. I love all this. Survival. <laughs> you're a self-help junkie. So all my videos are helping you to survive as a self-help junkie. That's what you're doing. Especially notice the specific survival demands of your ghost. Your particular ghost has certain specific things that it needs. Not just common, I'm not just talking about common survival things like, yes, your ghost needs water and food and sex and friendship and a job and money and sleep. That's all obvious. You know all that anyways. I want you to notice what's unique to your self-image and your ego, to your ghost. Here's some examples. Maybe you're the type of person that needs to wake up at a certain time in the morning or otherwise you start feeling guilty. What's that about? Those are the needs of your ghost. Maybe you need to wake up at 8 a.m. and there you go. That's what you need. That's how you're surviving. And what are you surviving? You're surviving a, a very specific, particular way that you are. So what I want you to notice here is that unlike the way that we conventionally think is that, that we are some way and then we do stuff that is sort of what we do, like we think of ourselves as a physical object and then we do stuff and that sort of just like maintains the physical object. Change that model. Rather, think of yourself as literally being the things that you're doing such that if you stop doing them, you'll stop being them. And you might stop being at all if you stop doing everything all at once. 
See, so to be the way that you are, you have to wake up at a certain time in the day. See, it's extremely granular, but there's a lot of these granular things which all add up to creating the unique thing that you are, the, the, the unique personality and psyche and human that you are. So this is what we're trying to dissect and to deconstruct and to analyze here, to observe. Or for example, maybe you need a certain type of breakfast. And if you don't get your breakfast, you get cranky. What's that about? See, your ghost has developed a taste for a certain type of breakfast. And if you get the wrong type of breakfast, you're going to be upset. And what is getting upset all about? That's a way that you manipulate yourself and your environment to deliver to you that breakfast that you want. So if some server brings you the wrong meal at breakfast, you get angry at him and then you, you scold him and then he'll... By doing that, he then brings you the right breakfast and then you're happy. See? See what you're doing? But you, you don't, of course, know that you're doing any of this. You're just acting impulsively. Or, for example, you need to drive a certain type of sports car in order for you to feel masculine. And if you have the wrong type of car, you'll feel emasculated. And that will be very painful and problematic for you. Because you've developed this image of being this, this macho masculine guy and that hinges upon you having the right sports car. And then, God forbid, someone scratches your sports car <laughs> and that, your, your masculinity takes a ding. See how this works? Your sense of self is not only your physical body and any ideas and worldviews that you have. It's also the things, the physical objects that you get attached to as well. And the non-physical objects, you might get attached to some idea like that you're an American or that you're a German. And then, and then you have to defend that or maybe, you know, you have some, some organization that you're a part of and then you're going to defend that organization. It becomes an extension of yourself. Another example might be that maybe you need to listen to some specific type of music to help you relax. And if you get the wrong type of music, like some heavy metal music that you don't like, that's going to ruin your relaxation. What's that about? See, your, your ghost has certain music that it likes and certain music that it hates. But are you aware of that? Maybe you need to do your meditation every morning or you feel guilty. What's that about? Because your ghost has some spiritual image of yourself as some yogi or some meditator, some self-actualizer. And I've, I've programmed you through these videos to meditate every day. And so now, see, you've got that mind virus inside of you. And you say, oh, Leah, but it's good. Meditation is good. Yeah, but uh, how many of you meditate really unconsciously and um, robotically? And then feel guilty about not doing it when you miss a day. But Leo, you said I have to meditate every single day. <laughs> you see, it's very tricky. It's very tricky. As you're growing through this whole process, you're developing and you're becoming more conscious. It's not like you can perfect yourself in a single day. You're, you're really kind of like crawling out of a very, very deep hole, inch by inch by inch by inch. And so it'll take you decades to, to really uh, perfect yourself. So, um, you know, it's like a bootstrapping process. We're bootstrapping ourselves in this work. And so don't expect to be able to solve all of this in, in a day or a month or even a year. This is, this is heavy stuff. This is your life's work here. Right? So be patient. <laughs> um, yeah, there, there's a lot of deception and delusion within you that we just can't address it all at once. We got to, like, bite away at it piece by piece by piece. Maybe you need to get a text message from your lover, from your girlfriend, from your boyfriend, from your spouse in order to feel happy. And then if you don't get that text message, you feel upset or fearful or whatever. Oh my God, what happened to them? Why aren't they texting me? See, that your, your, your ghost has those needs. Or maybe you are a troll. And so you need to post your daily troll comment on some YouTube video or on some online forum. Otherwise, you can't survive as a troll. You see, to be a troll, you have to dr do troll things. And if you stop doing troll things, you literally will die as a troll. The troll in you will die. So you feel compelled to do it. 
or maybe you need to judge so-and-so today. And that's how your ghost becomes judgmental and stays judgmental. Or maybe you need to worry today, or maybe you need to procrastinate today, or maybe you need to play five hours of video games today, or maybe you need to watch three hours of YouTube today. Because that's how you survive. You might think, well, Leo, but three hours of YouTube, this is hurting my survival. It's hurting the survival of some imaginary self that you have. Maybe you imagine yourself to be this very productive person. So yes, it's, it's hurting you becoming that, but it's maintaining you as the lazy person, which is what you are right now, this lazy person. How do you think you stay a lazy person? By doing lazy things. See? So what are all these activities accomplishing? They are letting you be you. Try not doing one of these things and watch your ghost react and bitch and moan and come up with excuses and suffer and go through pain and torture. That's what it's like. Try going one day without wiping your ass. See how you feel. You won't feel like yourself. Just with that little tiny change, you won't feel like yourself anymore. I'm not saying you have to do that or live this way. I'm just I'm just saying by notice that by changing these things literally we're affecting who you think you are and how you actually are. At a metaphysical level. That's very important to get. So, I want you to become very clear about what it is that you are busy surviving. What is that ghost? Pay extra careful attention to your thoughts and your emotions because these are the trickiest and the most significant and the most devious ways in which you survive. I want you to notice that they have been completely hijacked to serve survival such that you can't think straight anymore. Literally, you can't think straight. Every thought you have is a thought about survival. Even all your lofty thoughts about self-improvement and enlightenment, still, they're all serving the ego's survival. Everything you think and feel, I want you to notice, has an ulterior motive behind it. One that you're usually not conscious of. You think and feel to manipulate and survive within the environment that you find yourself in. So, like, if you're, if you're working some busy corporate job, the thoughts and feelings that you have have to be of a certain type in order to maintain working there. You have to tell yourself certain things, a certain story, a certain narrative in order to allow yourself to work there. Otherwise, you couldn't work there. You'd quit. Or you wouldn't fit in with how your other fellow employees thought. Like, you can't work on Wall Street while at the same time believing or seeing, rather, uh, how damaging Wall Street is to... American society, for example, you can't. You have to bullshit yourself into thinking that what you're doing on Wall Street is somehow beneficial to, to, to mankind. Or I don't know what kind of stories they tell themselves, but they have to do that. They have to ignore their own feelings. They have to manipulate every day in order to maintain that whole uh, house of cards called Wall Street. And you do that all the time at your work and in school and everywhere else, in your relationship with your family, on and on and on. Here's a key insight for you. All your emotional ups and downs are survival in action. All of your drama, you know, that daily drama you go through, the highs and the lows, it's all survival. So if you want relief from that, you need to become a master of understanding survival. Uh, it's important to distinguish here between being a master of survival versus a master of understanding survival. These are two totally different things. Notice that I'm not telling you here that what you need to do is become more efficient at your survival. No. You need to become much more conscious of your survival. That's very different. You know, because like 
the people who work on Wall Street, they're extremely efficient at their survival. They're extremely efficient bullshitters, liars, dissemblers, manipulators, exploiters, uh, you name it, frauds, con artists. And some of them are good people. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, they're extremely effective at that. So by being extremely effective at, at survival, that's actually the problem. Part of the problem here is that you're so obsessed with survival and you're so effective at it that it's completely obscured your ability to recognize anything else, to live your life in any way. And so here's the fundamental problem of survival and why we're talking about it is that survival is suffering. The reason you suffer and the reason you can't be fulfilled or satisfied in life, no matter how hard you try, no matter how many yachts you buy, or how many uh, amazing people you have sex with, you can't be fulfilled because it's all survival. And so you keep trying and trying and trying and you just spin your wheels for decades and you don't know why it's not working. That's because you're stuck in survival. And survival is not designed to make you fulfilled or happy. Survival is designed to keep you in constant motion and to keep you surviving until you're dead until you stall out the clock. The purpose of survival is for you to stall out the clock. Yeah, this is heavy stuff, but also life-changing stuff. You know, a lot to swallow. So maybe you'll have to take it piece by piece. Uh, in conclusion, let me just say that survival, understanding survival is absolutely foundational to any kind of self-improvement or spirituality. And this is something that will require years of study and self-observation on your part. So let me help you to begin to do that with this following homework assignment. Study carefully over the next week the unique demands, the unique demands of your ghost. What does it want? What does it hate? Who is it trying to be? What is it trying to avoid? What threatens it? Who does it want to be? Contemplate all that. At the same time, observe yourself surviving for one week. Try to observe at the most micro level that you can, but also notice macro survival strategies that you might have. Make a profile, make sort of a list in your commonplace book or in your journal of all of your survival strategies that you can articulate. Sometimes it's a little, you know, it requires some study to be able to articulate these, to notice them. So start noticing them, especially pay attention to your emotions, your thoughts, and your reactions. And also profile, try to articulate your philosophy and worldview. What is your ghost's worldview? What kind of intellectual positions and beliefs is your ghost attached to that must be maintained and survived at all costs? Whether it's your nationalism, your patriotism, your socialism, your uh, desire for feminism or anti-feminism or whatever it is. Materialism, science, rationality, some religion that you have, some spiritual philosophy you have. Make a list of that and try to notice how you're reinforcing that as well. You're reinforcing your worldview by the types of books you read, the types of movies you watch, the type of people you have conversations with, the types of YouTube videos you look at types of channels you're subscribed to, the type of comments you leave under my videos. See? Start to interconnect all this stuff. Connect the micro with the macro and vice versa. Uh, also, let me warn you just as a, as a trap here. Be careful to distinguish between observing survival versus doing survival. So what I'm asking you here is not to change your survival yet. I'm not asking you to improve your survival or to judge your survival, I'm asking you to observe it impartially, scientifically, so to speak. This whole conversation is not about enhancing your survival, because that would just be more of the same. That's already what you've been doing your whole life. That's what every conversation you've ever had with anybody has been about. We're trying to do something kind of counterintuitive here, uh, something that you might not even think has any value because you see the the whole notion of value is already 
co-opted by your survival agenda. We're trying to sort of undo the whole game of survival to see if there's maybe a different way to live your life. One that is not centered around survival so much. Now, of course, as you should expect, your ego will object and will say, oh, but Leo, that's dangerous because you're undermining my survival. Yes, from your point of view, it'll look dangerous. That's why it's counterintuitive. That's why I said long ago that this work is counterintuitive and paradoxical. And you need to be able to be uh, forward thinking enough to see how you know blind survival, no holds barred, is maybe going to backfire in your life and will not get you the satisfaction that you think it will. We'll be talking about that and, uh, and a lot more that I have to say about survival in part two, so make sure you stick around for that. Uh, that's it for this part. Please click that like button for me and come check out actualize.org. That's my website. You'll find my blog. You'll find uh, the forum, the life purpose course, the book list. Speaking of which, I just updated with 25 uh, new books. That's free for anybody who's already purchased it. And if you purchase it now, then you'll get that update automatically. Uh, I have some very powerful new books there. So make sure you go check those out. And uh, the final thing I want to say to you is this. There is a possibility of life outside of survival. But just what that is, is difficult for most people to imagine because they're so stuck in survival. So we will be talking uh, more about that in part two. But uh, for now, I just want you to ponder the following question over the next week. What in my life is not survival? Because by doing the homework assignment I just gave you, you're going to find a million survival activities. But can you find something in your life that's not survival? That's tricky, but try to look for it, and that'll help you to, to get clear on it in part two.